They take him to a town about 100 kilometers south of Manchuria's capital, Shenyang. Here, he stays at a hotel managed by a Japanese club. Soaking in a mineral-rich hot spring, Pu Yi's mood improves. Amidst the steam, he visualizes the majestic imperial palace at Shenyang and the throne from which he will gaze down on his subjects. His good mood quickly evaporates the next morning. When he decides to take a walk outside, Japanese police tell him he'll need the permission of their Colonel Itagaki. Pu Yi waits anxiously, but Itagaki doesn't arrive. Instead, the Japanese move him to Lushun, hundreds of kilometers to the south. He starts to wonder if he's been tricked. In fact, the Japanese are trying to decide how to proceed. Three months pass in Lushun, and there's still no visit from the Japanese Colonel Itagaki. Pu Yi considers returning to Tianjin and writes to Itagaki giving 12 reasons why it is imperative that he become emperor, otherwise he'll leave. At this time, I did not care how many Manchurian people died, how the Japanese would rule this settlement, how many soldiers they would station here, what ore they were mining. What I cared about was regaining my throne. I wanted them to recognize me as emperor. If not for this, why would I have come all this way? If I wasn't going to be emperor, my existence would be pointless. While Pu Yi cools his heels in Lushun, the Japanese set up a committee to decide on the details of the proposed new state. In mid-February 1932, the committee holds a nation-building conference. There are two main factions, one arguing for a monarchy with Pu Yi as emperor, and the other for a state with Pu Yi as president. The two sides can't agree, and finally the issue is decided by the Japanese. The committee emerges to issue a declaration of independence, announcing Manchuria's separation from China. Now, at last, Itagaki goes to meet with Pu Yi. He tells him that the Japanese want to build a nation called Manchukuo. This nation would include five major tribes, the Manchu, Han, Mongols, Japanese, and Koreans. He shows Pu Yi the flag of the new Manchukuo and a pre-prepared declaration of the people of Manchukuo. He informs him that the committee has voted for Pu Yi to be the new nation's leader. He'll be its head of state. But Pu Yi isn't happy. What about the Qing Empire and his emperorship? Itagaki assures him that in due course a law will be passed to restore the monarchy. His role as head of state will just be temporary. Furthermore, if Pu Yi does not accept their terms, they will deem him hostile and treat him as an enemy. It's an ultimatum, and Pu Yi realizes he has no choice. Reluctantly, he accepts the offer. In March 1932, Pu Yi leaves Lushun and journeys to Manchukuo's new capital, Changchun. 
the two million square kilometers of land and three million people of Manchuria are inconsequential to him compared to the title of emperor. He's bitterly disappointed, but at least it's a start. The welcome he receives at Changchun goes some way to restoring his flagging morale. Behind the scenes, the Japanese have ensured a good turnout. Puyi's investiture is held at a government office. Though it's a far cry from the splendor of the Forbidden City, the grandiose ceremony makes Puyi more comfortable with his decision to side with the Japanese. After Puyi takes office as head of state of Manchukuo, he converts this Russian-style building into his imperial palace and legislative office. According to the Manchukuo constitution, as head of state, he's executive ruler. In theory, he can exercise legislative, administrative, and jurisdictional authority appoint government officials, and command the army, navy, and air forces. But Puyi quickly discovers that the real power rests with the Hall of General Affairs, which is directly controlled and staffed by the Japanese army. Puyi, the head of state, is just a figurehead. 24 years later, Puyi testifies at a special court-martial. Soon after the establishment of Manchukuo, the Japanese government implements a huge migration scheme. According to the plan, Japan will ship one million households to Manchuria over a period of 20 years. It declares, to massively migrate to Manchuria is in line with the needs of the political development of the Japanese empire. It is part of the state-run enterprise to fully make use of the land in Manchuria. What is not mentioned is the hundreds of thousands of Manchurians who are to be dispossessed by the new arrivals. Despite continuing Japanese encroachment on Chinese territory, Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang government are distracted by their obsession to defeat the growing power of a new threat that has been gaining in strength since 1921. The Chinese Communist Party, under the leadership of Mao Zedong. In 1931, the Kuomintang sign a ceasefire agreement with the Japanese army and declare several provinces non-military zones. The following year, 
the League of Nations Committee arrives in Manchuria and meets with Pu Yi and the Japanese at Changchun. Later, British representative Lord Lytton announces their findings. The Japanese occupation of this large part of China was not justified on the ground of self-defense and that the new state which had been set up was a Japanese protectorate rather than a genuine case of Manchurian self-determination. The League proposes an international intervention plan for Manchuria. Japan's ambassador addresses the delegates to voice his government's vehement opposition. It is a matter of common knowledge that Japan's policy is fundamentally inspired by a genuine desire to guarantee peace in the Far East and to contribute to the maintenance of peace throughout the world. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. The Japanese delegation storms out and gives notice of its country's withdrawal from the League of Nations. Qing supporters seize the moment to mount a campaign for restoration of the monarchy. I dreamed my emperor dreams again. I was very concerned about news from various fronts. I put my hopes in the Japanese army, even though they were massacring my Chinese people. When they occupied a large area, I threw a big banquet for them. I congratulated all the soldiers who took part in the battles. I wished them continuing good luck on greater endeavors. Later, a troop of Japanese soldiers were only a hundred miles from Beijing, but did not advance further, which was a big disappointment for me. To bolster the legitimacy of their actions in China, the Japanese now decide to upgrade Pu Yi's international profile. In October 1933, they inform him that the Japanese government will now recognize him as emperor. Pu Yi is elated. The day that he has hoped for for years has finally come. The first thing he thinks of is what he'll wear. Previous Emperor Guangxu's ceremonial robes have been kept, but the Japanese tell Pu Yi he's only Emperor of Manchukuo, so he can't wear the Qing robes. He must wear a military uniform they've designed. After a heated argument, they compromise. At dawn on the 1st of March, 1934, Pu Yi celebrates his coronation in full Qing regalia. After the ritual, Pu Yi emerges wearing the uniform designated by the Japanese army. So finally, after a roller coaster ride of events and emotions, Pu Yi realizes his dream. For the third time in his life, he's an emperor. And he's only just turned 28. A new chapter is about to start in Pu Yi's extraordinary life. One that he hopes will see him restored as emperor of all China. As it will turn out, however, he started down a path that will take him on a journey far stranger than he could ever imagine. In April 1935, Pu Yi makes his first trip outside China, but not to England as he had once hoped. Boarding a battleship, he heads for Japan. He still wants to be emperor of the whole of China, 
and is relying on the Japanese to deliver it to him. He plays a role of mutual respect, even saluting Mount Fuji as he passes it. In return, the Japanese treat him with great pomp and ceremony, parading their military might in force. The trip culminates with the ultimate honor, meeting Japan's Emperor Hirohito. Together, they inspect troops and visit shrines. After all his ups and downs, Puyi is understandably moved by his treatment in Japan. He feels like he is finally nearing his goal of restoring the Qing dynasty. On returning to Manchukuo, he declares, I am one in spirit with His Majesty of Japan. All my people should also share my spirit and be united with our ally in heart and mind. Puyi's Japanese allies now start to run into increasing resistance against their incursions into Chinese territory. They retaliate by enforcing draconian classification and assimilation policies, displacing Chinese villagers and looting their homes. Large numbers of civilians are brutally massacred and a network of concentration camps constructed. Whilst Pu Yi plays out his role as a puppet emperor from his palace in Changchun, within its walls, his personal life has been disintegrating. His principal wife, Wan Rong, empress since their marriage in 1922, has long felt neglected by him, both physically and emotionally. Bored and lonely, she has increasingly turned to smoking opium to escape her world. As time goes on, this becomes a serious addiction. By now, her eyes are hurt by normal light and walking an effort. Pu Yi has been turning a blind eye to her habit, but when she has an affair with her personal servant and falls pregnant, he's furious. Some say that he has the resulting baby girl burnt in the kitchen stoves at birth, others that the infant dies from an illness. Whatever the truth, from now on Pu Yi virtually ignores his empress. Possibly to punish one wrong, Pu Yi takes another concubine, or necessary decoration, as he would sometimes refer to his wives. But this one is different. Pu Yi actually loves 17-year-old Tan Yuling. She's the nearest he'll come to finding a soulmate throughout his life. A well-educated girl from Manchu nobility Yuling is quite progressive for the times, and also outraged by what the Japanese are doing in China. She starts to quietly influence Pu Yi against them. In a devious move, the Japanese now orchestrate a marriage between Pu Yi's brother, Pu Jie, and Lady Hiro Saga, a relative of Emperor Hirohito. Because of his reputed impotence, or just infertility, the Japanese suspect Pu Yi'll never have children. So any sons resulting from his brother's marriage will be half Japanese and heirs to the throne of Manchukuo. Although he knows his brother actually loves his new wife, Pu Yi is unsettled. 
When he hears Lady Hero is pregnant, he becomes even more agitated. When Pu Jie was to become a father, I anxiously went to a fortune teller. I was even worried for my brother. They wanted an emperor of Japanese descent, so both my brother and I were likely to be sacrificed. I breathed a sigh of relief when I heard he had a daughter instead. The Japanese now mount a full-scale invasion of China, and Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang government reluctantly decide to cooperate with Mao Zedong's communist forces to repel the invaders. Pu Yi finds himself in the increasingly uncomfortable position of having to support a foreign power against his own people people that he wants to rule once more. But he has burnt his bridges with the Kuomintang and can't possibly support the communists. Continuing on his fateful course, he exhorts the Manchukuo people to support the war effort of their ally, Japan. Even setting a personal example by donating gold and jewelry and stripping metal from his palace. Manchukuo now becomes a huge staging post for Japan's full assault on China. Its resources powering a massive military buildup. When dealing with documents submitted by the Japanese army, Puyi simply approves everything, barely bothering to read them. In fact, he's often signing laws that condemn his people to virtual slavery. Tens of thousands die from the forced labor and are unceremoniously dumped into mass graves. As their relentless advance continues, the Japanese now make a mistake that will change the course of the war and seal Puyi's fate. In December 1941, they launch a surprise attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Puyi's growing unease about his Japanese masters is heightened when his favorite wife, Tan Yuling, dies suddenly aged only 22 whilst being treated by a Japanese doctor. He believes they have murdered her because of her anti-Japanese sentiments. The evidence is unclear, but her loss is a devastating blow. For years, he keeps a photograph of her in his wallet, written on the back, My Most Beloved Yuling. Following Yuling's death, the Japanese tried to interest Pu Yi in taking a Japanese wife, but he suspects she'd be a spy, and after a year of mourning, selects Li Yu Chin, a young Chinese schoolgirl. I was 15, studying at a girls' school. They told me I was picked to enter the palace to study. I didn't have to pay and might even get a reward. My parents were afraid it was a scam and were unwilling, but they couldn't defy the orders. So I left home, carrying only my school bag. 
month later, Pu Yi makes Li Yuqin an imperial consort. By early 1945, the war is going badly for the Japanese. For the first time, the people of the Manchukuo capital Changchun are ordered to conduct air raid drills. Pu Yi now lives out his puppet emperor role in a daze. Increasingly anxious about the Japanese chances in the war and his own fate as emperor. And he's right to be worried. In February 1945, at Yalta on the Black Sea coast, Soviet Premier Stalin, US President Roosevelt, and British Prime Minister Churchill are meeting to decide the world's fate. They agree that once the war in Europe is won, the Soviet Union will join the war against the Japanese. Pu Yi now spends his days glued to the radio. What he hears agitates him even more. By April, the Soviets have launched a massive assault on his notional ally Germany's capital, Berlin. On the 28th, he's horrified by the grisly circumstances of the death of the Italian leader, Mussolini. Two days later, he hears that Adolf Hitler has committed suicide. Soon afterwards, the Soviets take Berlin and Pu Yi realizes that it may only be a matter of time for the Japanese. On the 6th and 9th of August, the Americans drop atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the same time, Mao Zedong announces the final war on the Japanese invaders. Pu Yi and his entourage, the writing is now clearly on the wall. On August the 9th, the Japanese inform Pu Yi that the Soviet Union has declared war on them. he'll have to move from the palace to an underground stronghold they've constructed in the mountains. They warn him that if the Soviets capture him, he's sure to be beheaded. They give him three days to pack up his treasures. These include historic and irreplaceable works of Chinese art. As well as packing treasures, Pu Yi orders the burning of documents and films, anything that might connect him with the Japanese. Pu Yi was really afraid. This was incriminating evidence. People would find out how he had worked with and served the Japanese. He gave orders to burn the film, Present-day film does not burn, but in the past it was celluloid and highly flammable. I burned them at the stoves in the basement of Puyi's house. To the frightening sound of air raid sirens, on the night of August the 11th, Puyi and his family make a panicked departure.
They travel by train towards the underground stronghold, only to be diverted by the Japanese. The so-called stronghold is no longer safe. Eventually, they arrive in a small and deserted mining camp. It's the rainy season and there is no radio, no newspaper. They're totally cut off. It's now the 13th of August. Two days later, Emperor Hirohito of Japan informs his people of their unconditional surrender. With the news of the surrender, Puyi realizes that once again his time as an emperor is up. Just after midnight on the 17th of August, in a warehouse in the mining camp, before a few loyal officials and officers of the Japanese army, Puyi reads his resignation declaration, abdicating for the third time in his life. The Japanese tell him they'll move him to Japan by plane. Quickly packing his most prized treasures, Puyi selects a few men to come with him and leaves in the afternoon. A Soviet propaganda reenactment starring Puyi himself tells what happens next. On landing at Shenyang Airport, Puyi is arrested by the Soviet army. Many believe he is delivered to them by the Japanese as part of a peace deal, but there is no hard evidence one way or the other. On the afternoon of the 19th of August, 1945, Puyi boards a Soviet transport to fly into captivity and an uncertain fate. As Pu Yi flies into the unknown, Empress Wan Rong and the other women and children have been left to fend for themselves. Traveling on foot, they're soon intercepted by bandits. They had to unbraid their hair. First to go was the second mother. Something fell. A more stringent search was conducted. They went inside, where she stripped down to her underblouse and shorts. They searched through the clothes, ignoring cash, and took only jewellery and valuable items. Empress Wan Rong is eventually arrested and taken to a jail. Cut off from her opium supply, she descends into a nightmare world of withdrawal and despair. At the age of only 40, the last Empress of China dies in prison and is buried in an unmarked grave on a hillside. While the Chinese people celebrate the defeat of Japan, Pu Yi is arriving in the Soviet Union as a prisoner. He and the nine men in his entourage are brought to the southern Siberian town of Chita. They are detained in a relatively comfortable former Soviet army officer's sanatorium. Security is tight, but Pu Yi and the others soon realize they are going to be treated very well in the circumstances. Every day, we had three sumptuous meals and a Russian-style afternoon tea. There were service personnel, doctors and nurses to conduct health checks and also a radio, books, newspapers, 
and various kinds of recreation equipment. There were people who took us on walks. I immediately felt satisfied with this kind of life. They are soon joined by some other high-ranking members of the Manchukuo regime. The Cheetah Sanatorium now becomes overcrowded, and Puyi's group is moved to a villa in Khabarovsk, a town close to the Chinese border, just to the northeast of Manchuria. Here, life is equally good for Puyi. His Russian guards even get him a set of Chinese shell and marble furniture. To pass the time, Pu Yi begins to read about the Soviet system. He can't understand communism at all. He confuses Bolsheviks with an aristocracy. He's bewildered by the revolution and execution of the Tsar. When told there's never been a Bolshevik emperor, he naively wonders if he can be the first. Meanwhile, from January 1946, the powers that had forced the Japanese surrender commence a military tribunal in Tokyo to try alleged war criminals. The court makes a special request for Pu Yi to appear as a witness. After consulting with the Chinese, the Russians agree, and in August 1946, Pu Yi leaves the camp with his Soviet escort for the trip to Japan. The ex-emperor of Manchukuo is an important witness for the prosecution. He can establish the guilt of a number of Japanese accused of war crimes and testifies for seven days straight, the longest of any witness during the tribunal. His testimony attracts widespread media interest and packs out the courthouse. I became quite emotional on several occasions. When it came to Tan Yuling's death, I testified as if my own suspicions were confirmed facts and spoke with grief and anger even saying she was murdered by the Japanese. No doubt, I was very emotional. But I also wanted everybody to regard me as a victim of persecution. Pu Yi walks a fine line at the tribunal. He's accused of being a criminal himself on more than one occasion. He later admits that he lies on a number of occasions about his involvement with the Japanese and that his testimony could have been much more damning, but only at a risk to himself. The Kuomintang Chinese government asked the Soviets to extradite Pu Yi to them when he's finished at the tribunal, but they're backing Mao Zedong's communists, so refuse the request and return him to Russia. In China itself, Mao's forces are starting to make serious inroads in their bloody military struggle with the Kuomintang, starting to adopt an offensive rather than defensive strategy. Following Japan's surrender, Chiang Kai-shek had expected to defeat Mao and the communists within a year. But after two years and a series of reverses, he's starting to realize that there's a very real possibility that he'll end up the loser 
in the protracted civil war. Things go from bad to worse for the Kuomintang forces, whilst Mao's communists receive a hero's welcome as they take over more and more major strategic centers. Pu Yi is now increasingly worried about being sent back to China. On his capture, the Russians had let him keep his suitcase full of treasures, some of which he now offers to help the Soviet people. He also writes to Stalin, asking if he can stay in the Soviet Union permanently, but receives no answer. His growing fears are heightened when the communist forces finally triumph in mainland China whilst Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang followers flee en masse to the island of Taiwan. On the 1st of October, 1949, the People's Republic of China is officially founded. Early in 1950, Mao Zedong and Premier Zhou Enlai visit the Soviet Union. In their meetings with its leader Stalin, they ask for the extradition of Japanese and Manchukuo war criminals. As a gesture of friendship, Stalin agrees, and Pu Yi and the others are put on a train back to China. This is what Pu Yi has been dreading for years. All he can think of is that each new dynasty executes its predecessor. He's sure he's going to die. After a three-day journey, Pu Yi reaches the town of Fushun, close to Shenyang. Ironically, it's the very birthplace of his ancestors' Qing dynasty. Pu Yi and the others are taken to a prison, constructed during the Japanese occupation. It's officially designated a re-education camp. On entering, the once revered Emperor of China becomes just a number. Detainee 981. At first, he can't cope. He's never, even in Russia, had to do mundane chores himself. In the outside world, the Korean War breaks out. In September 1950, the American-led United Nations forces are threatening to overrun the communist North Koreans, and the Chinese People's Army crosses the border to aid their allies. Fushun is not that far away, 
and the prisoners are moved to a camp further inland. Here, the daily routine involves constant reading and rereading of communist texts and histories. Pu Yi now attempts to curry favor with the authorities by offering his priceless imperial seals to help support the war effort. He's first amazed and then deeply moved when the camp boss tells him that he also has the things he gave away in the Soviet Union. He explains that for the people, the person himself is more important, especially if re-educated. It's a turning point for Puyi. Up until now, he has merely been thinking of his own survival. He remains in the second camp for two years. In the process, he gradually becomes fitter than he has been since he was a child. When the Korean War grinds to a stalemate ceasefire in 1954, Pu Yi and the others are moved back to the original camp at Fushun. And now the process of re-education begins in earnest. A committee arrives at the camp to interrogate the inmates ahead of possible trials. It's a scary time, but the interrogations are not aggressive. Puyi's real problems come from the confessions of his own family and advisors. All expose his complicity with the Japanese. In August 1955, the committee shows Pu Yi the results of their investigation of him, listing several major crimes. Conspiring with the Japanese to revive the feudal rule of the Qing dynasty, signing a treasonous treaty with the enemy, willingly complying to Japanese wishes and endorsing policies and laws endangering lives, participating in anti-communist agreements, supporting the war of aggression, and finally destroying evidence and attempting to abscond to Japan. Devastated, Pu Yi writes a detailed confession. As the emperor of Manchu court and Japan's compliant traitor, I brought hell upon the people. Because I was a co-conspirator in robbing Manchuria of its resources, manpower and riches in support of the Japanese imperialist invasion, I brought an historic disaster upon the people of China and Asia. Ironically, Pu Yi's fate is in the hands of Mao Zedong who starts his revolutionary journey at 18 in the very year that Pu Yi first abdicates. Mao's first essay is Karl Marx and Pu Yi. In it, he wrote, once a person has been an emperor, he will always want to be an emperor again. But in 1956, Mao declares that although Pu Yi and others have committed serious crimes, it makes no sense to execute them. It is far more useful to re-educate them to serve the people. Later that year, Puyi's fourth wife, Li Yuqin, comes to the camp. She wants a divorce. The camp management is against it, thinking it might upset Puyi's re-education process. 
It is considered so important that the authorities set up a special room and allow Pu Yi and Li Yu Chin a night together to work things out. But it doesn't help, and Pu Yi signs the divorce papers. He is now single for the first time since he was 16. Another of the prisoners' re-education tasks is to write up their life stories. Over a period of three years, and with the help of Brother Pu Jie and other court officials, Pu Yi compiles a 450,000-word historical account. In September 1959, Mao unexpectedly proposes a general amnesty for the war criminals. A few days later, the People's Congress passes the motion. When the deputy director of the camp tells him of the possible amnesty, Puyi doesn't believe it will include him. His crimes are too great. On the 4th of December 1959, the prisoners are assembled and the amnesty names read out. Pu Yi's is one of the first. He's not expecting it and can't believe it. Brother Pu Jie has to nudge him before he reacts. Finally, the emotion of the moment overwhelms him. After 10 years of re-education from a reactionary feudal emperor, I have become a common laborer. From a ghost, I have become human. The old Puyi has died, and today a new Puyi is reborn. Five days later, Puyi arrives at Beijing Station, a free man, and is met by his sister. This new life is about to begin. Living with his sister, Pu Yi now becomes an ordinary citizen. even voting for the first time in his life. Pu Yi's neighbors treat him kindly, referring to him as Old Pu. Often, he's disoriented and can't find his way home. He's getting used to a completely alien world. Uncle frequently come to visit us. Sometimes he collected his money and he would lose it immediately. Finally, he tied a large wallet firmly to the back of his trousers. However, he was still prone to losing things. After a while, Pu Yi moves from his sisters into a hotel arranged by the authorities. He starts taking nostalgic walks, especially around Tiananmen Square and the Forbidden City, now known as the Palace Museum. During the Chinese New Year celebrations of 1960, Pu Yi unexpectedly gets an invitation to a private meeting with Premier Zhou Enlai. Zhou 
It was the first time I went with Puyi to meet Prime Minister Zhou. Prime Minister Zhou asked him what he would like to do. He said he wanted to be a doctor. The Prime Minister was amused. In the past, you willfully changed prescriptions. If you were a doctor, you would probably kill someone. He suggested Puyi do some writing work, like uh, writing about his life. This could be a lesson for the future generation, making it a work that benefits society. Zhou suggests that Puyi work part-time at the Beijing Botanical Gardens. Later, they'll find him something else. Mao Zedong himself also asks to meet with Pu Yi. He suggests that he should marry again, joking that after all, an emperor cannot be without a consort. Pu Yi isn't so sure. Most of his marriages have been unsatisfactory in one way or another. His work colleagues, however, like the idea, and one shows him a picture of a nurse named Li Shushan. Pu Yi agrees to meet Shushan, and they fall in love. They take to going out to movies and tranquil locations around Beijing. In April 1962, Puyi marries for the fifth and final time. His wedding speech reveals just how far he has come since his days as an emperor. In the past half of my life, I had always been served and reliant on others. Today, in the latter half of my life, I am proud, self-reliant worker. Puyi of the past only thought of himself. This Puyi has gone. He has died. I now build my small family among this big one of 650 million people of all nationalities. I am very happy and very encouraged. Mao had also suggested that Pu Yi should write about his life experiences. It turns out he has read the life story from Fu Xun, but thinks it's a bit on the heavy side. Zhou Enlai also gets involved and sends it to the Beijing People's Publishing House. After working with editors, Pu Yi's book, The First Half of My Life, is published. It creates a sensation in China and also abroad, where it is translated into several languages. Pu Yi and Li Shushan now have a good life. Comfortable at home together or attending social functions and receptions for visitors. At other times, they go visiting Pu Yi's brother and sister at their homes. Pu Yi's never really been happier. As an indication of the extent of Pu Yi's political rehabilitation, Mao and Zhou now arrange for him to be elected onto a prestigious national committee. Being on the committee gives Pu Yi the chance to travel the country and witness some of the rapid development taking place.
What Pu Yi treasures most is his newfound freedom. I was the number one prisoner of my palaces. Today, I enjoy real freedom and equality. I can go anywhere. Something I never dreamt possible in the first 50 years of my life. Just as he is starting to feel relatively comfortable, Pu Yi comes under renewed threat on two fronts. His health has started to deteriorate significantly, and he's also victimized by a tumultuous movement known as the Cultural Revolution. As a former emperor turned war criminal, he becomes a target for the zealotry of the revolution's Red Guards. One of the Red Guard's tactics is to publicly shame their victims. Pu Yi escapes public humiliation, but his salary and food rations are cut, the royalties from his book denied him, and even some of his furniture removed. To add to the stress, he is diagnosed with bladder and then kidney cancers. He undergoes a succession of operations, becoming progressively weaker. In his 61 years, Pu Yi has gone from godlike emperor to political puppet, then a pampered prisoner in a foreign land followed by life in a re-education camp as just a nameless number. From the ashes of his former glory, he finally emerges to find some kind of peace with himself and the bizarre world that has shaped him. In early October 1967, Pu Yi is admitted to the Beijing People's Hospital for the last time. At dawn on the 17th of October, the last emperor of China's extraordinary life finally comes to an end. Twenty-eight years on from his death, Pu Yi's wife Li Shuxian brings his ashes from Beijing and reburies them near the tomb of his Qing predecessor, the Emperor Guangxu. There is no epitaph on Puyi's tomb, just his name and the years of his life. Mm -hmm. 